the great majority of people out there are sort of consumed with their everyday lives, and, uh, and that's not really a slam on them, but people, most people, have to get up, they've got to go to work, they've got to earn a living, they barely have any time left, they have very busy lives, we have a very busy country devoted to generally material, uh, a search for uh, uh, material wealth, and, and uh, that's just what we are, uh, you know, not uh, in, in total, of course, but um, a majority of the people don't have time to sit back and think about the larger ecological picture, for example. You know, they don't, just don't have that time every day. Well, uh, interestingly enough, uh, acknowledging these particular scenarios, uh, and we can even look at the, the past at other civilizations as sort of precursors as to what's going on with humanity, I also think that there's a phenomena of intervention um, on the part of what we might refer to as that, this, this, that there is a spiritual uh, process or a spiritual intervention, and I begin to see what I have come to label as uh, the Jonah uh, phenomena. Uh, Jonah was the prophet in the Bible, in the Judeo-Christian Bible, who, although a reluctant prophet, um, went and he prophesied the fall of a city. And yet the people in the city um, had repented um, the points that Jonah had pointed out about the quality of their lives. And Jonah, who was in a profound meditation when he returned 90 days later, thought that he had failed as a prophet because the city still stood um, and did continue to survive for a number of centuries. Mm. But uh, God speaking to Jonah in a, in a classic biblical sense, in, of course I'm paraphrasing, uh, really sort of explained to him that he may have been the only successful prophet in the Bible <laughs> in the sense that prophecy and prediction is so that humanity and human beings may have the opportunity to generate this kind of course correction that we're talking about here, that if that red light has come on, and I agree that may indeed be the case, you know, are there things um, in our sciences or in human behavior or human phenomenology that, that maybe says that we can create a sea change here, or as uh, Bucky Fuller said, is there a trim tab there that, that can bring the ship state around? Well, I, again, I refer to Gordon Michael Skyen because I respect him uh, greatly as an intuitive, and he has said to me many times that indeed prophecy is exactly as you just suggested. Uh, most times it is not it's not like you could lay all your money down on whatever an intuitive might say because it might be getting served up as a warning to produce um, some sort of spiritual reaction that would produce a course change. However, of late, even Gordon Michael Scallion has been saying that the visions he's been getting now appear to be irrevocable and uh, uh, irreversible and that at some point uh, you do get to a place where what's going to occur is going to occur and all you can do is perhaps lessen the degree of the occurrence but not stop it any longer uh, once it has passed a, a certain point or the little red light however you want to think of it right that that agrees very much with what we know from physics in the sense that uh, it's almost like schrodinger's cat where uh, it talks about that because of the heisenberg uncertainty principle we can't know where a particle is exactly in time and space without it's losing its mass you know, is it a wave or a particle? And in the experiment with Schrodinger's cat, he wanted to demonstrate that by putting a cat in a box with a Geiger counter and a toxic substance, and kind of like in a Rube Goldberg-like way, the, the Geiger counter is, triggers and spills the toxic substance, but the box being sealed. And we're not knowing exactly what is occurring inside of the box on a quantum level. He is able to create a thought experiment that demonstrates that inside the sealed box is the cat is both alive and is both dead. And that not until we open the box and make an observation can we really tell which of those two competing probabilities has occurred within the specific time and space of that container. And I, I feel that we're reaching that critical point of observation um, for the planet as to which of these different competing sets of prophecies and predictions, or as they call it in science, probability fields, is more or less coming into manifestation. Uh, Kevin, from your own 
intuitive abilities uh, versus what you have studied from others, I guess, how, how am I going to phrase this? Do your own intuitive abilities uh, generally agree with the consensus? I, might, I have participated directly in studies uh, where we have where we have mapped a multitude of different trends, um, a number of which I spoke to uh, before. For instance, AIDS rising in prevalence, of course, is a is a classic concern because when you're when you're speaking in terms of a, an apocalypse, AIDS is certainly one of the more prevalent uh, sure ones is. threatening the human population. Yes, and it perhaps it's even a good model for what we're talking about because it is certainly present. Uh, it still continues to increase. In Listen, Kevin, I got news the other day that presently, as of now, one in eight residents of Africa have AIDS. Mm. That's one in eight infected with AIDS. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if there's not a reversal, that continent is virtually going to die. There are going to be certainly portions of the continent that are going to be barren. Barren. No human beings. It, it sounds like Nostradamus' predictions about, uh, about the depopulation of, uh, of different countries. And, um, you know, it's, it's indeed, when you ask me about my own intuitive abilities, they, we have been able to trace exactly these kinds of trends, which you, they, they sound remarkably like the trends uh, that are in the classic book of the Apocalypse, the Revelation. You have pestilence, um, you have uh, earthquakes in diverse places, you have um, the issue of, of war and famine uh, continuing to, you know, to plague humanity, sort of draining its human resources that maybe it could be putting into the solution. All right, we, we've got a break here. We're at the top of the hour, so you get a good rest. When we come back, a lot of intuitives lately have been talking to me about our sun. I want to ask about that. This is Coast to Coast AM. that a 25-mile piece of ice broke free in the Antarctic. The story, satellite images revealing that a section of ice about 25 miles long broke away from the Antarctic Peninsula, confirming an earlier warning by British experts that it was under threat. Ice, sh ice shelves have been in rapid retreat for the past few decades, apparently in response to a regional climate warming of 2.5 degrees centigrade or 4.5 degrees Fahrenheit since the 1940s. Images taken in February and March were compared by the University of Colorado to, uh, at uh, Boulder. Uh, that's the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And um, the image of February 26 shows much of the ice already to be gone. The March 23rd image made it crystal clear that a significant por portion of that ice shelf had broken off. Now, here's another story for you to consider, to file away in your gray basket, as uh, Stanton would say. The world's glaciers are melting quicker than scientists thought. A leading researcher said yesterday, <laughs> they are disappearing in Europe, the U.S., Africa, Russia, China, and New Zealand. A project to gather global information about glaciers shows that many have already vanished, and they are disappearing in the Alps, the Pyrenees, and the Rockies. In Spain, the number of glaciers has dropped from 27 to 13 since 1980. In a moment, Kevin Ryerson will be back. We're going to talk a little bit uh, about our son. A lot of interesting things uh, going on with our son.